Hi there, I'm Charles McAfee in Wichita, Kansas, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. Where does the real work get done in modernist preservation? State and local preservation groups show up at long, boring, and ridiculously bureaucratic public meetings week after week sometimes for years. They get historic preservation tax credits passed in most states, and they monitor everything from development to the preservation easements that we've talked about frequently. These local and state advocates are preservation's true heroes and heroines. Joining us in the studio today are two of those people from North Carolina, Preservation Durham's Julianne Patterson and Preservation North Carolina's Benjamin Briggs. Then from Chicago, we'll talk with Ben Thomas, He's executive director of the Society of Architectural Historians. Later, music with someone who is both Swedish and a North Carolinian, Helena Redman. And now, here's your host, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Thanks, Tom. Hey, folks, have you ever been to a city council meeting? They are the black holes of excitement. (laughs) Watching paint dry is exhilarating compared to a typical four- to five-hour council meeting. Well-meaning council members will sit around and discuss too many issues, many of which could have been decided by the city manager probably. Our members sit patiently while the public comments on everything from fighting pigeon poop to how our developer's Project X is a Godzilla going to destroy their neighborhood. There's a published agenda, of course, but you never really know when an issue is going to come up, so you have to plan to attend the whole enchilada. For a few years during the pandemic, You could at least make dinner or do laundry or put the kids to bed while watching these things over Zoom. But in most jurisdictions, we're back to the in-person, multi-hour torture. In the midst of all these meetings are our local, intrepid, historic preservation professionals who sit and wait their turn to present, sometimes for the third or fifth or seventh time, about why it's remarkably less expensive to rehab a building than tear it down. If you know one of these wonderful people, Please take them out for coffee, or better yet, make a donation to their organization. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by June Goldfinger and Jeff Taylor, sponsors of Circle, Square, Triangle, a traveling exhibition on the architecture of Myron Goldfinger, and by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. The front lines of modernist preservation, the people that work the hardest for the longest, are at the local and state level. They are your hometown heroes. Yay! And just about every major city in America has a historic preservation organization. They are typically called Historic X or Preservation X, where X is the name of the city or the state. We've long recognized the importance of their advocacy, resources, and expertise. Way back in our first show, our US very Modern- first show of U.S. Modernist Radio, our first guest was Myrick Howard, CEO of Preservation North Carolina. Myrick recently retired, but today's guests carry that organization's influence forward. Julianne Patterson is the new executive director of Preservation Durham. She got a BA from Virginia Tech. Go Hokies! A Master's in Historic Preservation from Clemson. Go Tigers! And she recently worked for Preservation North Carolina. Benjamin Briggs is the new CEO of Preservation North Carolina himself, with a BA in Architecture from NC State. Go Wolfpack! A Master's in Historic Preservation from Boston University. Go Terriers! Everybody's going here. (laughs) And 20 years as Director of Preservation Greensboro. Go Greensboro! Yay! (laughs) Welcome, Julianne and Ben. Thank you. Thank you. So, Ben, let's start off with you. Your family goes back a long time in North Carolina, and I understand there's a car collection somewhere? 
Well, yeah, my family, uh, old Quaker family uh, in North Carolina. So we go back quite a bit to the 1700s. But not so long ago, my dad was a collector of cars, where I'm a collector of old buildings. He always said he was a collector of cars instead of buildings. So, yeah, he collected Corvairs. Uh, He liked late 1967, 68 Corvairs. So at one time, he had about 14. Weren't Corvairs the unsafe at any speed car? That is correct. And he he was not a fan of Ralph Nader for saying that. I would imagine so, yeah. Yes, and are any of these cars still around? So they've all been deaccessioned and they've all found new homes now. Dad passed away about eight years ago. So okay. with his passing, they they found new homes. Now, is your Quaker upbringing kind of informed your approach to preservation? Quakers have an interesting approach that revolves around community and also mysticism. But more of the community side of things relates to historic preservation. And when Quakers build something, they would build something to last Um, And that sort of ties into historic preservation, too. In other words, don't throw an entire building into the landfill. Uh, Recycle, reuse. Now, Julianne, in Durham, Mm -hmm. you are working on trying to save an important building downtown, the Milton Small Design Home Security Life Building. That's right. Which used to be a police station. And you're trying to help the city council wrestle with options of saving the building versus tearing it down. That's so right. how is that going? Um, <laughs> it's an interesting time to be asking because the city just released the RFPs that they um, collected at the beginning of March. So those just became public at the beginning of the month. I don't think the city council has had a chance to really look at everything yet. Right now, everything's still kind of in their internal review process. But at Preservation Durham, we are trying to kind of rally the troops locally and inform everybody in Durham about the the three options. I say three options. There's three options that include preservation of the building. There are two options that do not. So we're trying to... We're going to call those the other options. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even talk about those. Those aren't viable. But unfortunately, the city will see them as viable. And the big thing that seems to keep coming up is cost and cost of rehabbing the building. But as you know, I know we've talked about this several times. There's so many extra costs that go into demolition of a building. I mean, embodied energy, the cost of demolition that aren't really accounted for in the balance sheet of these projects. So we're just trying to educate everybody at the local level to understand that you can't just look at the numbers and make like an apples to apple comparison. Um, And the preservation of the building is important for so many reasons, historically, architecturally, but also from an environmental standpoint. I've been in the building and it's it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. It's got cherry and mahogany walls. It's got these terrazzo floors these floor-to-ceiling glass windows. If you look at some of the early photos of the site, Incredible. it is as brilliant a modernist building as there ever was anywhere in the country. So why is it historically important to, to save it in Durham, North Carolina? Um, it's important for several reasons. The original founders of the Home Security Life Insurance Company um, are important to the city of Durham. But then what I keep stressing is kind of this bigger contextual significance of the fact that this was historically the white insurance company. And it was built on this corner at this major intersection in Durham um, of Duke and Chapel Hill Road. And on the the next corner, built a few years later, is um, the NC Mutual building. And that was the black insurance company. And the NC Mutual building kind of towers above it and is still kind of this huge statement of civil rights and black capitalism and black commercialism and power in Durham. And kind of having the juxtaposition of those two buildings next to each other tells a story. But then there's also the later history of the Milton Small building um, in the 90s, which is when two architects in Durham, Pat Harris and Phil Freelon, were hired. It was their first public contract by the city of Durham to do the retrofit for the police headquarters. When it became a police station. Mm -hmm. And that's the story that is often not really told. But um, these are two local African-American architects in Durham. Phil Freelon went on to have a huge career. And Pat Harris is now on our board. So when I talk with Pat about it, she says, she's like, it's not the Milton Small building. It's the Pat and Phil building. (laughs) (laughs) But she, I know, and rightfully so, wants that story to be told. And when the building goes away, a a lot of times the stories go with them. Now, Benjamin, you're dealing with projects all over North Carolina. What are some of the advantages of 
rehabbing or renovating a building versus tearing it down, both from a financial standpoint and from an environmental standpoint? Well, and and there are other ways to look at it, too. But environmentally, you're keeping stuff out of the landfill. So, you know, you and I might save aluminum cans and plastic bottles and things to keep out of the and glass to recycle. And one house can wipe out my lifetime of recycling materials. So keeping materials out of our landfills that don't need extra materials in them, there's embodied energy. Even these uh, historic buildings were built in a time when energy came from a different source. So big windows let in light and they don't have need to turn a light bulb on. They have porches which cool the house. So, you know, there are all these little tricks that were built into these houses. Economically, here in North Carolina and other states have different versions. They have historic tax credits. So these are tax advantages that come back to the investor, the the homeowner, the building owner. And sometimes they can be quite lucrative. 35% of, of the building can come back. They're often tax abatements. So these are meant to uh, level out the playing field for new construction versus old construction, original buildings. And to balance it out, sometimes they need a little a little boost at the beginning. But it can be lucrative to tap into these tax credits and uh, to, to renovate and reinvest in these buildings rather than just destroying them. Preservation North Carolina has been around a long time. When did it first start paying attention to modernist houses as something to preserve? Well, this gets to be closer to my, my lifetime and my career I know that the around the state of North Carolina, there was not a lot of love for modernist buildings in the preservation movement in the, in the 80s and, and arguably into the 90s. These were often the buildings that were built at the expense of earlier buildings that might have been 100 years old today had they remained. So maybe there was an antagonistic relationship there, but we kind of got our foot in the door with modernism, uh, at least in Greensboro around 2007, when we began to celebrate a single architect there, Edward Lowenstein. And Edward Lowenstein loved historic buildings. He was on the board of Preservation Greensboro back in the 60s before he passed away in 1970. And uh, he understood old buildings, often integrated historic features together. So it kind of was the the bait for historic preservation folks to feel good about modern buildings. And then once people started to see how these buildings worked and the materials, beautiful materials that you'd see in modernist buildings, uh, open spaces, they, they embraced it. And you've got Edward Durrell Stone Building in High Point, right? We do. We're proud to have the City Hall. So that's an internationally known architect, marble building. Uh, on the exterior with sort of the hanging gardens motif on the four sides and a pyramid capping the whole thing. So uh, new formalism in design, a beautiful atrium in the middle. And the city council chambers is actually under the pyramid. So when you're in city council chambers, you can look up into a pyramid. Sadly, that is likely to be threatened in the next year or two as High Point seems to be uh, focusing on building a new city hall in another part of town. And uh, with our furniture market in High Point, we very well might see the loss of that building. Although, what an amazing showroom that would make for a oh furniture gosh, company. Oh, my yes. Holy cow. Talk about bragging rights. You know, <laughs> our, our showroom's designed by Edward Durrell Stone. That would be the best. So, you know, maybe we can manage our way through this with a preservation easement that could be held by Preservation North Carolina and some creative uh, solutions and strategies. Julianne, as you're working on saving this building mm-hmm. in, in Durham, the numbers seem to argue in favor of saving the building. I understand that it costs about $150 a square foot to renovate the building and $500, $600 a square foot to tear it down and build a new. That would seem like a slam dunk to me, but how come the city council is not catching <laughs> on to that? Well, it depends on who's actually doing the math. <laughs> okay. And so, yes, you're right that when you are adding in the use of the historic tax credits, that yes, you can get the price down to like $158 a square foot for renovation, which is unheard of right now. Um, the problem is that, yes, those estimates are a couple years old now. The city of Durham has been struggling with this project for, we're, we're right at the 10-year mark now. Preservation Durham has been looking at this um, for the last 10 years. But a lot of times the argument is made against it being an affordable option because, well, what if you don't get the tax credits? And what if what if we want to build higher? And so looking at the proposals, 
that were submitted to the city, it's been really, really helpful to see that actually the numbers do pencil out. And yes, while we might be off by a dollar or two here and there in the estimates that we've been like radically trying to make behind the scenes, they do pencil out. And in talking with some of the developers, all of them pretty much agree that the highest and best use of that building is keeping it in place and not demolishing it. I think there might be only one development team that would maybe prefer to develop without the building. But I think so much of it does come down to just reframing your mind into how these projects can work and how they can work successfully. And I think if you don't understand historic preservation and you're you're not doing it every day like we are and kind of see and go through these um, tax credit projects, it seems like a heavy lift and it seems like something that is going to take more time, take more money. And the reality is, is if you look at it on paper and you hire the right people for the job, it can actually save you money in the long run. And there's no question that at the end of that project, if the Milton Small Building is rehabbed, that's going to be a building that's going to stick around way longer than probably anything else built on the site because of the original materials that are already in that building. And rebuilding that building with the materials and um, the methods that it was built today, even even though it's not a 200-year-old building, it's still going to give you a better building than we would build now. And Durham has a great history of taking mid-century buildings like the Durham Hotel. It's been fabulous. 21C mm-hmm. is great. The Unscripted. The Unscripted Hotel mm-hmm. downtown. The Jactar, yeah. Which used to be called the Oprah Building, I think, when Oprah was going to maybe buy it. Oh, yes, yes, back, yes. Right? <laughs> right? I've heard that story. <laughs> yeah. And actually, one of the development teams did propose turning Home Security Life Building into a boutique hotel. And um, in talking with them, we were like, go downtown. Like, there is a precedent for this. We, I mean, the Durham Hotel and the Unscripted are two examples where they've used historic tax credits and rehabbed a mid-century modern building into Gorgeous now, space. like, three to $400 a night hotel. Yeah. Not that I'm saying that's what we need in Durham, but there's a precedent for it. Now, Benjamin, you mentioned earlier about preservation easements, which we've mentioned on this show umpteen times and will again more umpteen times. So tell our listeners basically what a preservation easement is and why they should be thinking about it for their mid-century modern house. Sure. Well, preservation easements, and we also use the term preservation covenants. An easement is a right that is donated from the property owner to uh, an easement holder, which is usually a nonprofit organization. Covenants are rights that are withheld from one owner to the next. So For example, if Preservation North Carolina owns a building and then we sell it to a buyer afterwards, then we would retain a covenant on that building. So we use these interchangeably. But an easement, think of also uh, of a bundle of sticks as you're looking at a piece of property. And out of that bundle of sticks, a few of those sticks might go to the easement holder or covenant holder. That might include the facade of the building. In some cases, it might go onto the interior of the house and might reference the beautiful mantles or uh, the beautiful floors, certain doors and things of that nature. But these are all architecturally contributing elements of the building that make it a wonderful place. And the reason why uh, easements and covenants are important is because in most places in the United States, even if a building is listed to the National Register of Historic Places, and in most cases, even if they're locally designated, not every place, but that means they still can be destroyed and demolished. So in a state like North Carolina, Uh, The only way that you can really assure that a building won't be lost to demolition is through this legal agreement. And it's a retention of these architectural features and these and the facades or in some cases, even the landscape around the house will be retained in perpetuity. And that will be the responsibility of the easement uh, holder like Preservation North Carolina to make sure that that's adhered to in perpetuity. So it's, this is like a homeowners association for one house, essentially. For, for in perpetuity. In perpetuity, <laughs> right. Know, and the idea is and that— And Preservation North Carolina are the uh, police that regulate it, uh, make yes. sure people are complying. That's right. Police uh, is maybe a, a little yeah. drastic term. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, it's— The, the, preser- advi- the advisors. <laughs> the preservation <laughs> enforcement officers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We So the idea is not to freeze anything in amber, you right. know, uh, because I want people, when they come home— at the end of a long day to throw their keys on the counter and go, I love this house. Um, I want people to have their family there at at Thanksgiving and everybody say, I love your house. 
or your building or whatever it is. So I want houses to be loved, and that requires an element of change. Bathrooms and kitchens sometimes need to be changed. But when you do that, don't destroy the features that when you renovate, don't renovate for renovation's sake. So for, for modernist buildings, they might be a little more sensitive to renovation sometimes because materials matter, glass views and, and orientation to exterior spaces for modernist buildings in North Carolina get to be very important. But that's kind of our primary tool. So we're approaching 900 easements in North Carolina that PNC manages. And um, some of them are little mill houses. Some of them are big giant factories. Uh, some of them are mill villages and lots of historic farmhouses and mid-century modern now. We're even getting some mid-century modern buildings uh, even today. So it's a great tool. And you have one by a well-known architect coming up. We do. Here in, in Raleigh, we have a really wonderful postmodern uh, design that was completed in, uh, in 1989, 1990. And so we're trying to get our hands around uh, how exactly to move forward with that, maybe including some color. But uh, Frank Harmon and his wife were devoted to architecture here in town, and he wants to make sure that the building doesn't get destroyed for a replacement property. So it's exciting. Uh, 1989, 1990 is not that long ago. No. Now, Julianne, in mm -hmm. your job day to day, mm -hmm. you're like to go back to our police analogy, you're the beat cop on the street, right? You're the <laughs> one that is, that that is going to a lot of meetings, right? Yeah, yeah. So what kind of meetings are you going to in a typical week? Um, well, right now, the majority of the meetings are just going around and meeting everybody, meeting as many people as I possibly can in Durham. But we, we also hold our own easements and covenants. So we have um, easements and covenants, mostly covenants, on about 55 properties in Durham County. And there's there's a lot of a lot of requests for changes and review and things like that. So a lot of a lot of those types of meetings that Benjamin was just talking about and reviewing requests for additions and things like that. But also going to the Historic Preservation Commission meetings and looking at what requests for alterations and minor works, um, COAs and all of that are being requested at the local level. And so those are for all of our local landmarks. And then at the, at the local level, I mean, this is the biggest change from working at a statewide organization now at a local nonprofit is all of the all of the committees that are required to just make everything happen that we do. Um, we're a small organization. It's uh, myself and then I have a part time staff person. So we rely very heavily on an amazing group of volunteers that makes so much of what we do happen. So a lot of meetings with all of those, a lot of those folks. And then, yeah, just getting out and trying to meet the people in the community that are actually doing preservation or maybe trying to not do preservation and trying to convince them otherwise. So like meeting with the um, various developers that were looking at the Milton Small Building and uh, going and taking a look and convincing them, hey, this could be a great rooftop bar. <laughs> there you go. Um, so I, I really love the the more local approach and actually like getting, I don't know if it's just because of uh, being inside for so many years of COVID, but getting out and uh, meeting people and kind of seeing what's going on at the local level has been a lot of fun. Benjamin, what buildings around the state are in danger besides the one in High Point? Are you hearing more from that era, 60s and 70s, that are under the gun? So it really varies. Different uh, communities have different rates of success right now, and the economies are operating at different values. So in North Carolina, the, the bigger cities, Charlotte, Durham, Raleigh, are seeing a lot of economic growth, and that is putting a lot of pressure on especially residences for teardowns. So the, the trend is to buy a, a modest house on a normal lot and to tear that modest house down and build a ginormous house on a modest lot. So we're seeing two types of houses in these cities that are really beginning to disappear. One are the modest, smaller houses that were often uh, occupied by workers. That also includes a lot of shotgun houses and bungalows, which are the hallmark of southern cities. So we're seeing a lot of loss in that category because of their smaller size. And oftentimes, the, especially the architect design mid-century modern houses were built on larger lots. Their interiors were integrated with exterior spaces. And here in North Carolina, we have lovely forests and, and wooded views. And often these houses kind of 
have big windows, window walls that spill out into these exterior spaces. And developers just see a large five-acre tract of land <laughs> where, where right, we, right. We, we see this house that's sort of a jewel box that's arranged very deliberately to take advantage of views and forested areas. So both of those in these larger cities are under pressure, not so much in the smaller uh, cities, smaller towns quite yet. It's happening, but that's where preservation easements come in. But there is an awakening around the state. Um, all of North Carolina is beginning to see prosperity and change with economic development. Even the smaller towns that are more remote are the frontier today, and people who can't afford Charlotte, Raleigh, and Durham are looking at much smaller towns uh, like Lenore and, and Wilson, and, and we were, had an event in Farmville this past weekend. So in those cities, I'm just gently reminding people, sometimes historic means 1960s and 1970s, yeah. and in some cases, even 1980s now. So think before you just let somebody tear something down and evaluate and make a smart choice in what you're keeping and, and what is going away and being replaced. It's been a problem for decades, really, that you look at a modernist house or building, and it doesn't look old necessarily. It still can look like the future, not like your grandma's house, which looks, you know, really, really old. These buildings can look like they just got built maybe 10 years ago, some of them. Yeah, well, especially so those of, of us who are a certain age, like myself. But my grandmother, who was born in 1901, hated Victorian houses. My mom, who was born in 1927, loved Victorian houses, hated craftsmen. Uh, <laughs> you know, then I'm born in 1967. I, I love it all, you know, <laughs> and I've been fortunate to see that modern, mid-century modern is getting attention. And now it's very exciting to hear postmodern is actually getting some attention. So it's cyclical, and we, we don't need to have that. We need to appreciate good architecture, great architecture when it's there and not be so subjective. Julianne, when you're not going to meetings, your group also puts on some great tours every year. Yeah. You had a great tour this last May. Mm -hmm. I think it was called Rambling Ranch. Yeah, right? it was. What was that? So it's great to talk about this tour right after hearing Benjamin talk about the different periods of architecture and people who grow up in, kind of in those houses might not have a, as much appreciation. Because the main purpose of our Rambling Ranch tour was to bring awareness and attention to this unique, sometimes some might say mundane architectural style. But uh, we have wonderful ranch houses all around Durham County, really all around the state. And we just really wanted to highlight, hey, these are these are historic houses. These are right at the age where they should be considered historic. I'm kind of looking at the 50 year, or well past the 50 year timeline now. The National Register looks at for age. But really kind of bringing attention to how the ranch style, it's a really adaptable style. And it was originally designed that way. Um, I mean, the rambling feature kind of, you could always add on to accommodate the house and the family, but it's a timeless design. And so on our tour, um, gosh, we had seven great examples that show kind of all across the board from the more modest to the really kind of over the top ranch style and kind of also how they take on a more like vernacular and local style as well. So um, the one house, I don't know if you went to it or not, but it's a very modern on the outside. But then the interiors were all colonial revival. Mm, yes. um, and it's a house that had been in the same family now since about 1953. So they've really preserved a lot of the interiors. How do you do that? You you leave very carefully. You leave yeah. all of the colored bathtubs. <laughs> so they have like a blue bathtub, a pink a bathtub, pink one, yeah. a purple Green. one, yeah. just yeah. like in colonial days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's not quite the colonial revival aspect, but the, like most of their antiques and furniture inside, very colonial revival. So you can tell that they kind of were the original family. Really loved this more modern architectural style and wanted um, their house to reflect that, but then still had that more kind of like traditional Southern colonial revival aesthetic for their interiors. So it's really neat to see that. But a funny backstory for our, the tours that we put on every year, we literally cold call people around Durham to ask if they can be on the, if they're interested in being on the tour. So we have, again, like a wonderful committee that literally drives the street of Durham, whatever our theme is that year, and kind of like pinpoints, okay, a list of like, literally 300 houses that they think would be a good house on this tour. And then I mail letters out to all of these property owners asking if they would consider being on the tour. And when I first came on at the beginning of the year, 
I was like, there's no way people are going to respond to this. And they do. Oh, yes, they sure do. (laughs) And especially because I think because it was a ranch theme this year, so many of the people that responded were just shocked that a historic preservation organization was interested in their house in that way. Um, And people were so honored and touched and everyone was so honored and thrilled to be on the tour this year. So it really is a testament to kind of how that house style has really made an impact on the people that live there. And so many of these houses are so well taken care of. You can learn more about Preservation Durham at preservationdurham.org. And you can learn more about Preservation North Carolina at presnc.org. That's P-R-E-S-N-C dot org. Juliana Benjamin, thanks for stopping by. Thanks Thanks so much for the invitation. It's awesome to be here. That was our conversation with Julianne Patterson and Benjamin Briggs. Ben Thomas is executive director of the Society of Architectural Historians, based in Chicago. The SAH serves an international membership of over 2,300 people who work to chronicle buildings around the world. Thomas earned a PhD in archaeology from Boston University. Go Terriers! And was director of programs for the Archaeological Institute of America while teaching at the Berkeley College of Music. Here's George's conversation with Ben Thomas. Ben, let's start off by talking about Anna Jarvis. Do you know who Anna Jarvis is? I don't. Anna Jarvis is the creator of Mother's Day back in 1907. And you have something in common with Anna Jarvis. You created National Archaeology Day. So what is all that about? Uh, That's a great question and not what I was expecting talking about the Society of Architectural Historians. Yeah, this was something at my previous position at the Archaeological Institute of America. We were, again, a professional organization, but we also had lay members and we had local societies. And so all the stories we were hearing, and this was about 10, 11 years ago, all the stories that we were hearing in the news were just sort of very negative about archaeology and destruction of sites. And while we acknowledged all that, we were really excited about celebrating kind of that sense of discovery and the thrill of archaeology. And, you know, it's one of those topics that you talk to people on the street and almost everyone will say, oh, I was always excited about archaeology or interested in archaeology. And, you know, and then they get practical and decide that they can't make money doing archaeology. So they find some other career. But it was one of those things where we want to really celebrate kind of the joy of archaeology. So we contacted our local societies and said, look, we're going to designate a day on which we want all of you to just do public events. We'll invite folks there, we'll coordinate it, and we'll just do a day to celebrate archaeology. And even as we were planning it, we got calls from all these other organizations, other archaeological groups that said, we want to be part of this. And so even that first year, we had our, uh, some of our local societies, but a, a number of, uh, at that point, mostly U.S. and Canada-based groups in that first year. But by the second year, there were international groups that want to be part of this. And all we said was, just let's pick a day. And we made it the third Saturday in October every year. Uh, And we said we would just sort of celebrate archaeology through public programs. So that was our one thing to say, you know, all your programs should be accessible to the public. And that's what it was. It just took off and people loved it and we loved doing it. And so then we created a blog for it, a website in which you could list your events. We promoted it. We talked about it. We went to conferences and talked about it. And we just sort sort of pushed it out there and we just kept getting more and more people So in a few years, there were several hundred organizations around the world that would participate. And at one point, we estimated between the direct events and all the additional publicity, there were a quarter million people around the world that were participating in an event in some form around Archaeology Day. So yeah, that's what it was, just as an idea to celebrate archaeology. And it worked out. Well, that's fantastic, because it really does make archaeology more accessible to the average person, because most of the time when you hear announcements in the news, it's either something has been discovered or something has been damaged, right? Exactly, exactly. (laughs) And also, you know, there were several periods of war, and especially with the Iraq situation and the museum getting looted and sites being destroyed, and then there was just generally a bunch of things that were happening. We're talking about the destruction. Like I said, we didn't want to minimize that in any way, but we also wanted to just sort of bring out that idea that there is something about discovery. There is something about learning about our human past, about connecting to it in many ways. And it is something that 
people enjoy. And so that's the part that we wanted to focus on on one day of the year and the rest of the year we could focus on everything else. (laughs) Okay. All right. One more archaeology question and then we'll get to architectural history. You're an expert on Mayan archaeology. What happened like 10, 12 years ago? The Mayans had predicted the end of the world and it didn't happen. Wasn't that supposed to be like the cataclysmic Mayan prediction of it's all over? Yes. What happened with yeah, that, Ben? So that, 2012. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because the ancient Maya didn't think of time as linear. Okay. They thought of it in terms of cycles. So you had one cycle that would kind of come to its completion. There was a period of sort of a little bit of unrest before the second cycle be- or the next cycle began. So everything is cyclical. One cycle ends, the next one begins. In addition to that, they have these calendars that kind of keep track of time in a cyclical fashion. Within that, there is this one calendar called a long count, which tries to be a little bit more of kind of a discrete count of days, individual days, as opposed to just the cycle. But even that is not straight linear, it's cyclical. And it goes through these large periods known as baktuns. And at the completion of a 13th baktun, it was supposed to kind of reset and start again at one. Yeah. That 13th Baktun completion happened to fall in December 2012. Okay. Now, the Maya themselves, the ancient Maya, don't predict that as the end of the world. They predict it as the end of a cycle, and they believe another cycle is coming. And in fact, we have inscriptions from the Maya world that they're predicting things well beyond that 2012 date. So they are not concerned about the world ending, but they are talking about a cycle ending. Ah, okay. Somewhere along the way, I think maybe in the 60s, when there was a proliferation of doomsday cults, (laughs) you start to get this idea that the Maya predicted the end of the world. And that catches on. And it becomes sort of perpetuated and people are talking about it. And it becomes this thing, this thing that says, oh, the Maya predicted the end of the world. They didn't. And as we see, it didn't happen. (laughs) So, but that's what it was. So there were actually people who firmly believed that the Maya calendar predicted the world would end in 2012. Yeah. And they were getting ready for that. And they were, I think, disappointed the next morning. When, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were all sort of continuing with our work and our social activities and things. But yeah, that's what it was. Well, I'm glad to know that there are more cycles on the calendar. I don't have to worry. <laughs> no. No, they're predicting things well into the future. So they are not concerned. Now, you are the executive director of the Society of Architectural Historians an organization that is working to preserve the history of buildings, the history of architects, the history of urban planning, things like that. How do you make architecture history more accessible to the general public, kind of like you did with the archaeology? Yeah, so I will say the Society of Architectural Historians is is primarily a learned society. So the majority of our members, 2,000 plus members, the majority of them are probably connected to uh, universities and colleges. But we also have a number of just practicing architects, a lot of preservationists who are working on historic preservation Mm -hmm. of buildings and spaces. But architecture is, again, one of those things, kind of like archaeology, Everybody has kind of a basic understanding of what it is. And this I'm talking beyond the discipline, beyond just the practitioners. People you meet on the street have a fascination with architecture, fascination with the built environment, some knowledge of things that have happened, particularly maybe in their area. And so it is one of those subjects, I guess, that there is a general interest and understanding of basic architecture. And this, you know, our headquarters is in Chicago. In Chicago, this is extremely... Oh, yes. Anyone on the street will give you a bit of a little spiel on architecture in Chicago or encourage you to take the river tour to see the architecture. So there's this sort of connection to the built environment. It makes sense. We have houses, we go to offices and buildings. So that connection to the built environment is real. And so what we were trying to do is to say, look, we have all this great information. We have scholars. So how can we get this out to the public? Most of our work is like, you know, like our annual conferences and our journal are probably not as maybe user friendly as they could be. But in addition to that, we do a lot of programs, especially post pandemic virtual programs. And these are anything from workshops to panel discussions to lectures 
that all sort of focus and revolve around the built environment, both the sort of the physical architectural issues, but also social issues connected to built environments and spaces and use of space and who has access to space and those kinds of questions. We also have online resources. I think the most known is our Buildings of the United States series that focuses on each state Mm -hmm. and tries to do a database of important buildings, uh, built landscapes, and it goes uh, historically from sort of ancient to modern. We also have online uh, a digital version of that encyclopedia called Archipedia. Archipedia was initially based on the buildings of the United States, but now we're actually doing new content that is only on Archipedia, the, the, the online version. So while he's mentioning this, let me give our listeners the website, because this is a great site for looking up buildings. It's sah dash archipedia.org. That's A-R-C-H-I-P-E-D-I-A dot org. The Archipedia is open access and anyone can get to it and look at it. The other uh, resource that we have, and this is for members, is actually an image data bank. Sahara is our image database, and it is just a wonderful resource. And these are images that are contributed by our members. They cover the whole sort of globe where our members travel. They take pictures, they upload it with just sort of basic information about that. So it's just a great resource as well. More and more, we're trying to kind of increase our resources for the general public. I think we do a good job of reaching the professionals and the academics, and we're always looking for new ways to reach the non-specialists. I think that whole aspect of discovery is what's so fascinating for both people in architecture and archaeology is to just come across something that expands your mind and is fascinating, particularly if it's large. I mean, it kind of takes me back to those Indiana Jones movies, you know, when he comes down the narrow passageway and there's this great treasury building right in front of him, you know, that kind of thing. That experience is so compelling. And there's a sort of an archaeological and an architectural moment, right? When you come through that pass and you see the treasury in front of you, having visited the site, it is one of the most remarkable entries into an archaeological site ever of the ones mm-hmm. that I see. It is just an amazing way to sort of enter a site and to see that as your first glimpse of Petra. But no, that sense of discovery is something that is, it's exactly what you're saying, whether it's a new site, a known site that you're seeing for the first time, a building, all of that, that you know, that you can find out more information about the site or the building through your own work, through others telling you, but that connection to the building that sort of then puts it in a broader context and also just gives it those extra layers of meaning. And that that I think is critical. So you're seeing beyond the surface. Now in archaeology, there are many mysteries. There are certain tombs people are trying to find or certain objects people are trying to locate. Are there any architectural mysteries out there that people are trying to discover? Are there some sort of top 10 list of things that we haven't discovered yet? Ah, uh, I don't know if we would know what we haven't <laughs> discovered in that sense. You know, I will say this. I don't think anyone's come up to me and talked about architectural things that they haven't found or that they're looking for in that sense. I think every building and every built environment has layers of meaning that once you start doing the work, you realize there were questions that you didn't even think of asking about use of space or uh, material and why choices were made in certain ways. There are all these questions that will come up, but I don't think anyone's ever come to me and spoken about uh, the top 10 things that, you know, yeah. that we haven't found yet. Because I found one during the pandemic. There was a house in New York that had been missing for 70 years. And the New York Times had hunted for it, and various documentary filmmakers had hunted for it. And during the pandemic, I solved the Scooby-Doo mystery and figured out what had happened to it and where it had moved to. And it was thrilling. It was one of the most fun experiences of my career to solve that mystery. And I was got to think that there are other mysteries out there. There are buildings that people know existed somewhere, but they don't know what happened to them. That might be a great way to get people engaged into the society. Uh, how did the building go missing? I'm just curious now. Like what, this, what was, to- this was a demonstration house that was built in the garden of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And when the demonstration period ended in October, the house just vanished according to records. 
They don't know what happened to it, where it went to. And what did happen was that it, they had sold it. And the father of the woman that bought it came down, took it apart, left a mess. There were lots of arguments with the museum over the mess that he had made. And then it went to an aircraft hangar for a couple of months, waiting for the summer. And then they rebuilt it about 35 miles north of New York. But all of this, for some reason, just got lost over the years. And in the pandemic, somehow these records got restored. And I found them through the museum. And the New York Times did a really wonderful article on it in 2021 in May. Yeah. Well, you know what, George? I'm going to guess that there are mysteries that people are looking for, buildings they're looking for, or spaces that they have been that have been talked about. I'm just not familiar with them. But I'm sure that, you know, if we put a call out to our members, yeah. sure we would get plenty of these <laughs> tech projects or these obsessions yes. that people have uh, with buildings. And I'm sure there would be. The other thing that along those lines that I've always been fascinated about, and several of us have now talked about this, both the office and just in general, we have a certain approach as architectural historians. You know, the way we see a city is different from the residents of the city. So I'm always curious about, especially in connection with their annual conferences, which move, to be able to do some sort of project or program where we get residents to tell us about their hidden gems, you know, the things that for them define the city or the town that they're in. And I would love to get a collection of what people see as relevant, significant, and important from their context, as opposed to just these academics kind of tell you sort of what is important or significant. I'm very curious. And so that's something I think we'll look at, but that kind of engagement with the public is something that I'm really interested in, to get to see what people who say, I love architecture, well, why do you love architecture? What about it is fascinating to you? Is it a particular building? Is it a style? Is it a time period? You know, I'm very curious as to what people would connect with. Besides buildings, architectural historians also track urban planning kind of efforts over time, more grander scale city approaches, and particularly an area of that that has been under study for 80 years is public housing and the projects that were built during the 50s and 60s that had to be destroyed and new public housing coming along. How much can we learn from the history of these projects to make, say, public housing for the future work? Because while some of it worked in the past, a lot of them were really failures. In my mind, archaeology, architecture, all of this is a database of human behavior, right? The buildings that we see, the sites that we find are the result of people's choices, their actions, the resources that they have. And so they're creating these in physical form and evidence of their thought and of the way they interact with the spaces and with each other. So this is a database of action, response, and as you're saying, failure. Now, what we can do with these records is we can figure out, okay, so what happened? When did this happen? How was this achieved? And we get an idea of why it failed. And if we can take that, and when we plan new structures or when we do our, our urban planning now, if we can bring in that knowledge, we have this incredible database that I think is underutilized. It certainly was in archaeology. I felt like modern society was not looking at the lessons of the past and saying, hey, you know, they tried this and it didn't work or it worked. Why aren't we doing something like that? And I think it's the same thing. I think we should be leaning much more on that to sort of say there are lessons to be learned or lessons that we did learn and we should be incorporating them in our modern thinking. What is that quote? Those that ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Something like that. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And and we see, we just keep repeating things. Over, over and, over and over again, over again right? Again, hoping for a different result this time. Yeah. How is AI affecting architectural history, if at all? Are people finding ways to use that to boost their work or help gather information? Do you see any of that happening within your association? I am noticing that a lot more of the professional conferences are focusing on the idea of AI and how it can be used. It's interesting because you get two reactions. There's the group that are like, AI is going to destroy everything. And a lot of that, I think, was especially focused on research and writing. Who generated this? How was it generated? Is it AI generated? Are my students using AI now right. to, to turn in all their papers? <laughs> you know, there was all that kind of fear. But I think also there is the realization that it is a tool. 
It is a tool that can do a number of different things. The part that I feel is a little bit underexplored is that there's a lot of tedious tasks that I think would result in a lot of important findings and understandings but no one has the time or certainly the funding to take it on. Could AI be used in those things to scour mm -hmm. records? But also, I think, you know, AI, especially with architect history, but also in modern architecture, this idea of using AI to visualize things, to build on plan views or architectural plans to kind of create options and give you the the variations on certain ideas or things that you can do would, would be a little bit more, I think, time consuming if you're trying to do it yourself. But through AI, you could be, can maybe look at different perspectives, different views of things, different ideas of how things should be configured and put together. You know, AI could be a tool to help us kind of understand space and the organization of space and the different options that we have, you know, those kinds of things, you know, this about the past as well, you know, how, how did spaces get used? I, I think there's a lot of potential. I'm not discounting the, the fact that AI could be used unethically or in a sort of more unguided way, let's say. But at the same time, I think it is like a lot of these technologies, it is a tool that if used properly, it could really, really help us in our understanding and particularly, I think, in, in our visualization, both of the past and of, of the future in a way. In addition to being a national organization, you also have chapters around the country. At the U.S. Modernist Library, we have most of the publications of the Southern California chapter of SAH online that people can see. What function do the chapters play in your organization? The, the national or the international organization has a certain mission, and we try to be as global in our approach uh, to everything that we do. So our annual conferences have themes from across the globe, all time periods. And we try to be kind of the home for anyone that's interested in the built environment, the history of the built environment. The chapters allow people with maybe more of a regional specialty, so the Southern California chapter, uh, and not just people who are interested in Southern California necessarily, but also just the architectural historians who are in Southern California then get a meeting space where they can now network with each other, communicate with each other, share information. So it becomes kind of a regional gathering of architectural historians. And what we've noticed with our chapters is that it is also the way in which a lot of our lay members connect with us. They connect to the chapters and they can then focus on uh, local architectural historians sometimes talk about local topics, but sort of a much more accessible architectural history than necessary, or it's the people even, much more accessible, much more local than having to deal with the national chapter, for instance. So I think it gives us kind of a regional presence when we went through these chapters. You can find out more about the Society of Architectural Historians, including the Archipedia we mentioned, at sah.org. Thanks for talking with me, Ben. Thanks, George. It was great. George was chatting with Ben Thomas. Swedish singer Helena Redman was born into a musical family in Vecchio in the south of Sweden and was influenced by her father's diplomatic career that took her from Sweden to Brazil, Cuba, and Prague. Described as unpredictable and deeply soulful, she now calls North Carolina home, and we're happy to have her close by. Here's George's conversation with Helena Redman. Helena, tell me about Vecchio. It's supposed to be the greenest city in Sweden. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful place. Yeah, there's there's definitely, I mean, all of Sweden is green, honestly. It is the, the land of 10,000 lakes. But yes, Sweden is beautiful and Småland, which is the area that Vecchio is in, is uh, definitely very forested and we have trees everywhere. Yeah, that was just uh, what I was used to, you know. It's a pretty small town, but it's one of the largest towns in Sweden. So it's kind of funny, you know. You have your own airport, I read. We do. You can fly in there, right? Well, you used to be able to. Honestly, last night, I'm going home this summer. I tried to find a flight flying into Vexjö last night, and I was not able to. So mm. I don't know what happened. Something oh, shifted. Yeah. So I'm going to have to take the train. <laughs> Which is not bad in Sweden. The Swedish trains are fantastic. Yeah, we have a fast the X, X2000, it's called. It's a fast speed train. It's great. Normally, five hours driving, but train is like three hours. You grew up, your dad is a diplomat. What kind of diplomat was he? So he worked for the Swedish government. Uh -huh. He started when I was uh, nine. 
He worked all over the world in embassies. He was the the second man in command. He was never the the ambassador, but he was uh, the second guy. And so, I grew up doing some exciting things, traveling around uh, all around the world. Really, what countries? I know you were in Brazil, right? Yeah, Brazil, and then he moved to Cuba. He lived in Holland, which I guess we call it the Netherlands here. And then he moved home for a while, and then Macedonia. After that, oh, Prague, sorry. Prague, Czech, okay. Czech Republic. That's a big, important one because that's where he met his wife that he's married to now. So, okay. Yeah, okay. Prague. And, you know, architecturally, Prague is a fantastic place. Um, you know, probably know that already. Just gorgeous. Oh, my gosh. I, I need to bring my kids back because they haven't been. And, and um, you know, my dad is married to a Czech person. So they have a apartment there. And so, yeah, we're definitely going to go back soon. It's It's a magnificent city. All these countries growing up have affected your singing career. How many languages do you sing in? Uh, I mean, I can sing in pretty much any language. Like, I can pronounce things. You know, my, my brain is a bit of a chameleon, so I, I tend to emulate things easily. So I sing Spanish, French, German. I do some Latin. I've sang in Sanskrit, of course, Swedish and English. Italian, probably. A little bit, yeah. When I did the classical training... I did some Italian. Yeah, I can pronounce like if I, I was singing Portuguese, someone will come up to me and ask me if I'm from Brazil. Sometimes I, I don't think that I'm that good, but people have, you know, <laughs> come up to me and it's like, no, that's I don't know. Don't even speak the language, but I can learn how to pronounce it correctly and stuff like that. I love dialects. Your recent performance here was really well received. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it was amazing. It was a great time. It was an honor. I was very grateful to get an opportunity like that, um, being kind of new in this town as well. So that felt really special to me. I'm very grateful. This first song by Helena is about 70 years old, but most people think it's much older. What a Wonderful World was written by Bob Thiel and George David Weiss, recorded by Louis Armstrong in 1967 as a single. But the interesting thing is, as they were recording it, one of the studio executives tried to break into the studio to stop it because he didn't really like the song at all. And <laughs> afterwards, he refused to promote it. And it took uh, a number of years, actually until 1988, when Good Morning Vietnam, the movie, reissued the song as a single, and it rose to number 32 on the Billboard Hot 100. Here's Helena with What a Wonderful World.
Elena, what brought you to North Carolina? Well, it, it goes back a little further because I, li- you know, I grew up in Sweden, and then I ended up going to Florida to visit my sister. Um, she had met a guy. <laughs> that happens. It happens, yeah. And um, she got married, and and I went to visit her. And I, I always say, you know, I literally like I forgot to go home, so I just kind of stayed. So it's a bit of a long and winding road. I ended up sailing back to Europe on a sailboat at one point, living in England, which is also a large part of my musical journey. So I lived in London for a while. Okay, wait, wait, whoa, 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 um, whoa, 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 go back. (laughs) Going across the Atlantic in a sailboat, you skip right over that part. So what was that all about? Oh my gosh. You know, I was 23 at the time and uh, working in Florida uh, with tourists, met a guy. And he had a boat and um, I don't know how, but I was cutting his hair one day. I have no idea why, but I would cut people's hair sometimes back then. I didn't even know this man, but I was cutting his hair. We were just kind of met. And so he said, I need to bring the boat back. And I was like, okay, it's a 48 foot cutter sailboat. And I was like, well, what do you need to do that? How are you going to do that? He said, well, I need a crew. And I literally took a, a, like a beat and I was like, I'll go. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Never sailed a day in my life. Two weeks later, I was on a boat going to England, <laughs> basically, which, you know, you stop in the Azores first. So it's a bit of a, that's a good story. I tell you what. <laughs> How long does that take yeah. in a 42 foot sailboat? It took us a month to get to the Azores, but we also didn't have an engine and we didn't have much wind. This was in 1992. So it took a month. I probably you could probably make it faster if we had an engine and more better winds. We probably would have made it faster. <laughs> but, so you got on a boat with a guy that you didn't know yep. without an engine and crossed the Atlantic. <laughs> we had an engine, but the alternator belt was dropped in the water the day before we left. He had bought an extra one, dropped it in the water by accident and didn't buy another one. And of course the alternator belt broke mm. along the way and then we didn't have an engine. So imagine trying to moor the boat and all that stuff. Anyways, it's crazy. The autopilot broke, so we had to steer the boat 24-7. And then he had programmed the sat-nav wrong. So we we had to use a little plastic sex tent to n- navigate. And every time we saw a cargo ship, I would radio them and ask for our precision. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it, it was crazy. But, yeah, one of those things. That's me. I mean, you see the thing behind me? Uh, I know the listeners can't see it, but it's a big painting with a big yes behind me. And... My philosophy in life has been yes. So uh, the pandemic happened, to get back to your question. And my son came to me. He's 25 now. Him and his wife came to me because when the pandemic happened, nothing was happening. And, and my my life was just halted, everyone's life. But as a singer, hugely impactful. I was a full-time singer and there was no singing and no performing. And he came to me and they asked me uh, to move up here. And uh, we did. And, and I fell in love. This place is amazing. We had wanted to leave South Florida because we were in South Florida for many years. My kids grew up there and I was, I had a great career there. I'm very grateful. But this place has been amazing in in other ways and opened some new doors for me musically. Well, we are very lucky to have you. And I love this next song. It's one of my very favorites. The Nearness of You was written in 1937 by Hoagie Carmichael and Ned Washington. It was intended for a film by Paramount. The film never made it, but the song did. It's been recorded by many artists. Very beautiful. Here's Helena with The Nearness of You. It's not the pale moon that excites me That thrills 
Elena, tell me about your performances. Are you going to be anywhere this fall? I've started doing, you know, the postmodern jukebox kind of thing. What is postmodern jukebox? I don't know that phrase. <laughs> well, there was a group of people who came up with the phrase, and, and it's really befitting. You know, it's a, it's a great name. Basically, you do newer music or, or contemporary music revamped and uh, reimagined as old music or like, you know, the 20s, 30s kind of music, you know, ragtime or swing. So, for example, we did a, a swing version of Le Freak. Uh, I freak out. Uh-huh. We do that as a swing song. I sing Kiss as a really fast swing tune, the Prince song, remaking contemporary songs into more classic sounding versions. It's so much fun. Oh, my gosh. I'm having a blast so with it. So you have to record these. Yeah. And come back on the show Mm -hmm. and share with our listeners Mm -hmm. the postmodern jukebox. This sounds fantastic. Yeah, well, that name is another band. I I will have to just, it will be the Helena Redman experience with this. Maybe we'll call it Red Velvet or something. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) And we just did, we've done a couple of gigs. We did it at the Exotic Car showroom in Raleigh, which is a beautiful showroom full of classic cars. And I wear like a long red dress with gloves and a flower my hair and all that stuff. I did kind of start doing cover music when I first came up here just to get known in the community and uh, work my way in, as they say. I had to start over, get more established. And But yeah, now it's it's going to be hopefully more jazz and, and R&B, which is kind of what I enjoy doing. But I also have a, a regular, more acoustic duo thing at Wakefield Tavern, which is in kind of North Raleigh. And it's really fun to kind of reimagining tunes in a more stripped down acoustic way, which is so much fun. We have a blast doing that. Helena, thank you so much for joining me. I can't wait to have you back on with more songs. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by June Goldfanger and Jeff Taylor. 
sponsors of Circle, Square, Triangle, a traveling exhibition on the architecture of Myron Goldfinger, and by Diane Bald and the Budman family, restoring significant architecture in Toronto, Los Angeles, Malibu, and Palm Springs. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 2,100 significant modernist houses, and access 4.3 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Shelby Hockenberry and Carrie Cesarino handled guest research. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another well-preserved edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. So when you go to that city council meeting, take a book, take your laptop, catch up on email, whatever you need, because you're going to be there a while. Bring snacks. (laughs) 